we want to talk to you this evening about uh, a community that we love, and we want to talk to you about a place um, that we think shares many characteristics with the community here. And we're really grateful to be invited by the Berkshire Community Land Trust um, to talk about some of the distinct characteristics of our community and ways in, in which we can actually look at rural working communities um, and learn from each other. So we're going to talk about some things that we think are absolutely unique to the place that, that we live. And inevitably, you're going to, to notice, well, we have some of that here, too. And that's a great sign. And it's exciting to see a, a movement around land stewardship, a movement around preparing another generation of farmers to share common characteristics in many, many places. Um, we spend a lot of time traveling around the country. And I actually have uh, the benefit of both serving as the president of, of Sterling College and the honor of also serving on the board of the, the Center for an Agricultural Economy. Um, but we spend a lot of time visiting communities and learning from them. So to have the opportunity to come and, and talk with you this evening um, is, is, is really gratefully um, accepted. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, I, I want to talk about is sort of the nature of the place that the Center for an Agricultural Economy and, and Sterling exist. And um, how many people in this room can say that they live in a kingdom? <laughs> right? Not many. All right. Um, we come from the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont, um, which technically speaking is, is, is three counties, Caledonia County, Essex County, and Orleans County. And about seven years ago, when um, I was invited to come to be the president of, of Sterling College, um, I was given a couple of different news articles about this really wonderful food shed, this amazing artisan food hub, this incredible agricultural and, and rural community, um, and, a, and a book called The Town That Food Saved, written by uh, an author named Ben Hewitt. Um, and several New York Times articles. And I think you can see some of the complication. Once something gets down in paper, it starts to be assessed and looked at a little bit differently than before. Um, you might know that from the New York Times. Um, we share uh, some experience with outside communities, uh, journalists looking at our community and trying to, to determine what it is that, that, that makes it that unique. And so as I got to experience this community, um, it felt a little bit like Brigadoon. Um, you know, there are aspects of it that really do measure up to our highest aspirations. And like any other place in the mist that covers the villages of the Northeast Kingdom occasionally, there are significant challenges that, that we face. And so we have this idea of what this Northeast Kingdom community can mean and can be in relationship to food and our food system. Um, and yet, we are a place in which many people work two or three jobs. And some people have two homes. Um, we're a place that's known for extraordinary food. Um, most of you will have had Jasper Hill cheese or some product from the Northeast Kingdom. Um, we're also a place that experiences significant food insecurity. Uh, we have wealth, and we're also a rural economic area um, partnership zone, a REAP zone. So many different dynamics going on um, within our community. But one of the unique characteristics that we have in the Northeast Kingdom is the relationship between a wide variety of not-for-profit organizations who are thinking about the human relationship with the natural world, thinking about a working landscape, thinking about the welfare of generational farmers and farmers who are coming into our community, and an educational institution. And that's what I'm really here to talk about, is the role that education can play in a community uh, that really cares about issues related to um, environmental stewardship. So Sterling, as a college, um, 
as, as John sort of described at, at the beginning here, um, is distinctive. It's a college that um, is a liberal arts college, but that one, one that looks at the liberal arts through uh, a concept of environmental stewardship, which to us means a love of place. It's a, a, an understanding that dates back to um, the publishing of uh, The Unsettling of America um, and Wendell Berry. And that's just about the time that, that Sterling began to, to develop its curriculum. So this is something that we've been doing for quite some time. Um, this is not a, a, a recent development, but one that has 40 years of experience and, and time uh, behind it. So we try to inspire lifelong environmental stewardship through experiential liberal arts education and prepare students to be knowledgeable and skilled and responsible community members um, in the places that they'll live. And I love to say that we're actually trying to train ecologists to be great farmers, and farmers, hopefully, to be great ecologists, um, which creates a distinction between the kind of agricultural education and a kind of uh, ecological education that one would receive at Sterling uh, versus that of a, a large public university or a different kind of mission-based um, institution. We're also an institution that cares deeply about social justice. We're a private New England liberal arts college where about half the students routinely qualify for Pell Grants. And we're one of only a handful of federally recognized work colleges where students have the opportunity to actually pay for a part of their education through work on campus. And that means a great deal to our community because one of the interactions between the college and the Northeast Kingdom is bringing young people to those three counties who want to build professional lives, who want to farm, who want to live in those communities and do Im important work. So we have to provide that access as a really critical piece of, of bringing those, those folks to um, our community. I think we know what two of the really significant challenges are for uh, farmers and for the rural parts of our country. The average age of a farmer in America today is over 63 years old, according to the USDA. And we know that we need young people to move to communities to be able to keep those generational farms going and to establish new, uh, new enterprises, which is something that, that um, Sarah will talk about um, at length. So only about 20% of the students who come to Sterling are from Vermont. But over half of our alumni live there. That's an incredible uh, window uh, into a new population of folks coming to live in a rural area every year. And I'm here to tell you there are only 135 students at Sterling. Change happens through small institutions. So if every year there are five or 10 new folks coming to the Northeast Kingdom who want to work there, who want to develop um, the communities in which they live, that's an enormous resource. As a college, we decided that, in fact, we also needed to reach students at all levels of interest and experience with regard to the working landscape. So about three years ago, we founded um, a school within the college called the School for the New American Farmstead, which is a um, continuing education program. And actually was born out of something that I bet some people in this room have probably said at some point, which is, God, if I'd only known about this college when I was 17, I would have loved it. And so we created an opportunity for people who are at a later stage of their uh, educational experience and who really want to be exposed to um, folks who are thinking and doing work in, in areas of sustainable agriculture and food systems. Um, 
at, at a really professional level. In order to do that, we, we founded another partnership with the Chelsea Green Publishing Group. And so most of our authors, or most of Chelsea Green's authors, um, who teach at the School of the New American Farmstead are working both with the college's students and with continuing education students. They're working with farmers who live in our community, and they're working with businesses that are located in our community. So we have an artisan cheese program that is in partnership with Jasper Hill. And then our graduates go on, potentially, to work at Jasper Hill or at other dairies or artisan cheese businesses that, uh, that are in the area with a liberal arts education that is broadly and interdisciplinary based um, in ecology. So I, I love this idea of this relationship across uh, all of these different enterprises within our community. But it is that engine of education that I think feeds all of the, the, the work that's being happen in, happening in, in our community. And to be clear, not all of the young people who uh, move to the Northeast Kingdom to, to pursue professional lives in agriculture are Sterling alums. But the fact that Sterling is there and that it creates this rich cultural experience within the Northeast Kingdom makes it a place that more people want to live um, and to work. You have colleges here, right? <laughs> you know, rural colleges are rarer and rarer in this country. And rural colleges can be bucolic places that people go for their college years before they return to the city. We have to figure out how to keep them in rural places. And I believe that there need to be different kinds of educational models, um, like the one that I've described uh, that Sterling represents, um, in more places. And so one of the things that Sterling has developed um, in partnership with the Berry Center in Henry County, Kentucky, is a program that we will call the Wendell Berry Farming Program of Sterling College. Now I'll tell you, a, a few years ago I, I, I visited Henry County, Kentucky, and I had the opportunity to talk about Sterling and to talk about the idea of an educational partnership. Um, I gave a presentation and afterwards Wendell said, um, the one thing I like about um, your chat, Matthew, is that it was economical. And I thought for a minute, well, what exactly does that mean, Wendell? Um, so you'll get a chance in just a, just a minute here. Um, but I, what I wanna say is that there, there's a relationship between the working landscape in Vermont and the working landscape in Kentucky. And there's a deep need for young people in counties across the United States that are trying to really address some of these really um, important food systems issue, issues. So the, the history of this program that, that, that we've begun, um, you know, really began with a couple of different conversations about place-based education. And in several of the educational um, uh, it was several of the colleges and universities that were thinking about having a partnership with the Berry Center thought about those partnerships as having been placed on their campuses. And when we had a conversation with the Berry Center, it was obvious to us, anyone who has read um, Wendell's writing, is that it would be place-based and it would be in Kentucky. And so the idea of creating another place-based educational opportunity um, in Henry County I think will have a, a similar impact on um, that region as, as, as Sterling has had um, in the Northeast Kingdom. It's a program that, like Sterling, is, is divided uh, between academic experience, work experience, community experience, and because we want students to have the opportunity to really have discerned that their life passion is in agriculture, it will be for students in their third and fourth years of, of college. Um, and we're working to create an opportunity for 25 farmers um, to um, join that community each and every year that those graduates complete the, the program. So in some ways, what I'm trying to describe to you is, is a beta. 
you have many things that are working within your community. We have many things that are working within our community. And we have challenges, and you have challenges. Um, but one of the things that I think is really important is the opportunity to bring higher education into the mix of the conversation um, about your working landscape. Um, so I think the, the, the barrier between higher education and this food movement needs to change within the colleges, not necessarily just within the communities. We need programs that are specialized and designed to, to really focus on the needs of the, the community that, that you have here. So I'm grateful to have a few minutes to, to talk with you and, and grateful to have some opportunity for follow-up with questions after. So thanks. So I have slides. I'm going <laughs> to open this, hopefully. Can you see that all right? Yes? No? Yeah, OK, good. Uh, first, I would love to just second Matthew's appreciation for being here. It was a beautiful drive um, south today through the misted landscape. Um, <laughs> and our appreciations for uh, the work of the Community Land Trust and the work of many of your organizations here in this region uh, and the vision that you have um, is pretty high. So we are also excited to listen and learn from you all this evening and hope that we can have some question and answer after this. Um, so as John said, uh, my role is as the executive director at the Center for an Agricultural Economy. We were founded in 2004 um, with a mission uh, for a place-based local food system that really was going to try to enhance all three points of a triple bottom line, understanding the environment, understanding and enhancing our communities, and being able to make an economic system work at the same time. But modeling that and living that work can be really tricky. And uh, one of the things that we've found is that the level of cooperation that exists within a community or within a system is an indicator for long-term sustainability and success. So to add a couple of statistics to what Matthew shared with you, right now in Vermont, 90% of our farms that have fewer than 200 acres have an annual gross income of less than $50,000. The average age of farmers in Vermont is around 60. In the Northeast Kingdom, it's more like 65 or 66. Only 15% of our 7,300 farms in Vermont have an income of over $100,000. And again, just to sort of place base you, Vermont as a state only has about 630,000 people. So we're a pretty small state to begin with. What we learn when we look at this picture of diversified and small scale farming and agricultural operations is that small can be beautiful, but in the economy that we've created at a global and a national scale, it's also often not sustainable. And you might know this better than I do, but we have not created our economy to best benefit our communities and our individuals. And I attribute a lot of that to the difference in the way our interactions work in an economy and the way our interactions work in a community. And what I hope to do tonight is to sort of um, share that a little bit more and then tell you a few stories about the work that we're doing. So at the most basic in an economy, the interactions are transactional. There's an agreed upon benefit, agreed upon value. There's always a price. There's an agreed upon value. And there's a direct benefit. So I give you a cup of coffee, and you give me $2, or maybe $3, depending on where you live. In a community, you pick up my kids after school, but I don't pay you for gas money, right? So in a community, the interactions are not. There is no agreed upon value, right? We do things for one another. We volunteer. They have a more diffuse benefit, the less direct benefit. And there isn't necessarily an exchange. Maybe I take care of your cat while you're on vacation, or maybe not. So I want to tell you a few stories about this sort of more complex and reciprocal level of interaction that happens in our communities and how we've paid it forward in a way to create programs and to create activities that continue to generate benefit. So the first one, if this, if I get the clicker, yeah? 
barn fire? OK. So the first one I want to tell you about um, started in 2011. Uh, there was a massive barn fire um, at Pete's Greens, which is an organic, diversified, four-season vegetable farm in Craftsbury. And hundreds of people donated money. Pete's had a CSA model, and so he had many, many people who were buying shares of food, and that year there was no food because it had burned. Um, but people paid for their shares anyway, and then they donated even more money, and tens of thousands of dollars were donated directly to that farm to help rebuild. And he was very inspired, and he wanted to pay it forward, and so with the Center for an Ag Economy, we created the Vermont Farm Fund. It's now been in operation uh, since 2011, it is essentially a revolving loan fund with 0% interest loans if you have an emergency. We also have below market rate loans for business builder programs. Since 2011, we have loaned out almost a million dollars to 67 producers across the state of Vermont, and we have had no defaults. So it's a really wonderful model of a completely philanthropic paying it forward but that continues to generate activity within the system. Another example, oh, sorry, there are some pictures of the various producers. <laughs> so that was what I meant to go to. So it gives you an example from one disaster, really. We share that risk and we share that benefit when we pay it forward. Um, it's some lovely pictures, so I'll just leave that up for a moment and then I'll switch it to my next example here. So the next example, uh, in 2009, we were looking at the Northeast Kingdom as a region and trying to discern what it would take to advance the food system for all three counties. And we wrote a regional food systems plan. And it's the only one in Vermont at a sub-regional level. Uh, it still is one of the food systems plans that people really turn to. I think I brought a few copies, but they may already be gone in the back. So if you want one, let me know. I have plenty of copies. Um, and we determined by working with our community members, our producers, uh, our farmers, and so on, that there were a few things that were really needed in our rural part of the state. And one was access to infrastructure that the producers did not have to capitalize themselves. So shared use processing and storage infrastructure. Another was support for small businesses as they grew, business planning, technical assistance, and so on. And the third was really just creating that network or creating that community between farmers, producers, and the market and the retail side. So we built the Vermont Food Venture Center, which is a 15,000 square foot building. We have three rental kitchens, we have storage space, and we incubate dozens of small businesses in any given year. They rent storage space or they rent the kitchens or they come and utilize the technical assistance that we provide. But, and this is the critical part of this story, the Vermont Food Venture Center would not exist without our anchor tenant. So, in essence, that 15,000 square feet, which is home to dozens of farm and food businesses, also has a single anchor tenant who supports the overall overhead and uh, revenue of the building, keeps it open, keeps it operating. The anchor tenant is a world-renowned artisan cheesemaker, Jasper Hill Cheese, who Matthew already mentioned. They knew going into partnership in this building that the benefit was going to be diffuse, that the return on investment was going to be long, and that their business essentially enabled the rest of this to happen. But the thing you need to know about Jasper Hill also is that they themselves are incubated in a certain sense. They have a partnership with the oldest and largest dairy cooperative in our region, which is Cabot Creamery. And they partner on a single cheese, which is Cabot Clothbound Cheddar. It's one of the most successful in their suite of cheeses. So really none of the small food businesses on the right-hand side of the screen there would exist without the working landscapes that are kept open by our cows and our dairy farms. So it's, once again, a paying it forward model. The reciprocity in these models is a lot more complex than just a simple transactional one. Um, the last one I'm going to tell you about. 
Uh, the Food Venture Center was opened both for those specialty food businesses and for farmers. But a few years in to running the operation, we discovered that our farmers were not coming to use the kitchens. They would use the storage, they would slaughter their cows, they would uh, do some season extension in the freezers, but they weren't coming in to value add their products and they weren't coming in to process to find a new market for something else that came off their farms. So we did some experimentation, we did a little bit of research, but we eventually settled on a social enterprise model that we call farm to institution. And we started by co-packing and doing various other things for farmers. But this model is a really interesting one. We are buying in local produce that grows well in Vermont, so mostly storage crops and root vegetables. We process them minimally. And then we tackle the institutional market, so colleges and hospitals and schools primarily. This market is really complex for a single farmer to get into. To, to have a college buy food, they often have a contract management service company who requires $3 million of liability insurance and a third party food safety audit. Da, da, da. It goes down the list. So as a nonprofit and as a sort of value chain facilitator, we can do a lot of that upfront work we can provide a revenue stream to the farmers, and we can utilize this building for the benefit of the local food system. So it's still a small operation. We've only done it for about three or four years, but we have been able to double the sales revenue almost every year. And still, we're only at about $100,000, so it's not that exciting. But we do work with dozens of farmers across the state, and we work with institutions both in Vermont and in New Hampshire. But. These market-based solutions and the, this sort of paying it forward model in the economy is only half of what is critically important in our work. The other side, the community side, is also vital. You can't just work with businesses to make a food system work because they really only represent a certain kind of power and a certain kind of leverage. We also need to understand how behavior changes and we need to understand how justice and equity and health and well-being are regenerated within our communities. We won't have people who continue to make choices for a more complex and reciprocal system unless we teach that when people are young. So one of the things we've done just recently is establish a formal partnership with our local school district, which is six schools in, believe it or not, four counties uh, with 1,200 kids. And again, each of these six schools with their own school board and their own system of governance uh, gets a little complex. <laughs> um, small district, but we're working at all the different levels in the school district. So we've worked with the superintendent, for example, to help rewrite the district-wide strategic plan to include sustainability and to include place-based education as a part of what they're doing. And we've worked in the gardens with kids, and we've worked to really build that connective tissue between our community partners and our teachers by getting them out into the community on field trips just for teachers and on professional development just for teachers so that they then pass that forward. And then finally, and this part's very new for us, uh, we took a look back a few years ago at some of the population level statistics. As Matthew was saying, our region of Vermont is one of the most economically depressed. One in four kids in our region is food insecure. Uh, our median household and per capita income in our part of the state is much lower, below 25% of our state average. And there are people in our communities with lived experience of generational poverty, of racial and ethnic discrimination and trauma, and so on. And these folks are often not included in our work because they are not a part of the traditional systems of power and of hierarchy and of change. Well, when we took this look back, we realized that this was not something we could change on our own. We were very uh, idealistic to assume that local food was going to be the lever that would then create social justice. Um, but it, you know, it's only one of the levers. Right now, we are working with 14 area organizations, including churches, including local granges and other associations, uh, to do community organizing. And um, while it may feel like a bit of a mission creep, it's also really critical to know that unless and until our society shifts so that people can have access to and feel like local food belongs to them, we're not actually going to change the agricultural system. 
So these people are working to change some of the larger challenges, things that we can't just do by providing business support to farmers. And we're really excited to be a part of it. The first set of issues that we're going to be working on in conjunction with this community organizing body are related to rural transportation, access to services, and then also children and youth and what they face growing up in small towns in a rural area. So those are a few of the stories. I think that's my last, yeah, that's my last one. Those are a few of the stories. And just to sort of summarize, uh, what I wanted to share with you is to think a little bit about what it takes to do some of this work. And I think that it takes unusual partnerships. I think that it takes reaching across from what our comfort level is or our, uh, the group that we usually work with is to find out what's happening for someone else. Once you can speak the language and understand the most critical need of an unusual partner, you begin to discover that there are a lot of commonalities that you might not have realized. You actually do want to change the same things. We also have found that collaboration over the long term is critical. So building those trusted relationships between partners is very important. And that your municipal and your statewide and even your federal partners will be able to understand what you're doing and see the impacts of what you're doing and really come on board. So ultimately, it takes a lot of us lifting in a lot of different ways. Um, but the, the breadth of programs that we've developed at the Center for an Ag Economy over the years have really emerged from what we've learned, both in being reactive and in being proactive to what's happening in our local communities and in the food system. So that's what I had to share with you. And I think Matthew and I are both excited to take questions or um, whatever else John and the board have in mind. <laughs>